Hello, marketers. Happy New Year and welcome back to Coffee with Comark Loyalty. I'm your host, Pindu Gupta. Today, we have a loyalty marketing mogul with us. He has created, implemented, managed, and measured customer marketing strategies for some of the biggest brands in the world for over 20 years. And he's passionate about understanding how people interact with brands and what drives their purchase decision making. Please raise your coffee mugs for the CEO of Wise Marketer Group, Bill Hannifin. Hi, Bill. Thank you so much for coming. We are so excited to have you. Bindu, it's great to see you. Good morning. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Well, thank you so much for joining today. It's, uh, it's been long overdue, I feel. It's, uh, you know, since since the time we've known each other, I think we have, you know, done a couple of, um, you know, panels together. So it's really great to have you on, you know, Coffee with Kumar Loyalty and pick your brain on a lot of exciting stuff. So thank you for joining again. I'm so happy to be here. Perfect. So to kick off, you know, this is our first episode for, for this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we really want to, you know, learn a lot about, different aspects of loyalty. But before that, I, I want to, you know, know more about your background and your role and your journey so far, you know, in this uh, in this loyalty marketing field. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. So thanks very much. But I pinch myself a lot because I started off my career as a banker and, and I never imagined that I'd, a banker would end up in a marketing field. But then it made sense to me over time because loyalty business is so quantitative. We measure, we like numbers, we We do the marketing strategy and what I like to call the fun stuff, the creative, the planning, the strategy, but we also at the end have to try to determine an ROI for clients and and brands that are running these programs. So it actually turned out to be a perfect fit, but I had no idea in the beginning. And I I really fell into the business because uh, I was working for Visa and they gave me responsibility for this little software product that they had. And they said, you know, Bill, um, even though your Spanish isn't good, you need to learn quickly. We're going to send you to Latin America and we want you to help all of our member banks down there launch these programs with co-brand credit cards and loyalty programs. I said, okay, what what is that? (laughs) So it was learning on the fly. I was learning how to speak Spanish and learning a little bit more about the loyalty business. And then um, I did that for a while. And then it suddenly jumped into um, being part of launching a coalition program in Peru. And that was the thing mm-hmm. that opened my eyes. The program's called Bonus. And believe it or not, it launched in the late 90s. It's still operating today, doing really well. And that was the thing that opened my eyes to, um, hey, these programs are not just about credit cards, but they're about so much more. And yeah. so it, it just kind of went from there. Hmm. I love that journey. I mean, you basically switched you know, your field altogether, you know, from finance to marketing. Um, and that's, I think that's a really exciting journey and I love the connection you made the ROI and the quantitative factors of marketing, you know, as today, you know, and really jumping in and taking charge of a coalition program, you know, which, which, you Mm -hmm. know, had no experience with. So I think that's a great, great idea and great example. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so I feel like every you know, beginning of the year, we are, as marketers, we are so inclined towards learning what's going to happen. Like, what's the what's the future going to be in, uh, for loyalty marketers in the field of loyalty for programs, right? So, uh, and, you know, as, as uh, anybody, as a marketer, you know, they love trends, right? They love to know what are the key trends? What am I going to focus on? What are brands thinking about? Are they going to, you know, completely change the landscape is it really going to happen this year you know or even in the near future so what are we um, what are the key uh, loyalty trends you know as based on your experience um, talking to so many different brands and different industries what are those key uh, trends you would feel you know would kind of change uh, our current landscape or maybe even shine uh, you know this year versus kind of what we've been talking about for a while, right? So I would love to know your thoughts on that. Right. So there there are three or four that we've been thinking about a lot. And one of them, the first one I was thinking about, and I don't know if we'll get a chance to talk about all, but we'll we'll get through a couple. One of them has to do with, it kind of reminds me of a New Year's resolution. It's one of those unfulfilled promises, like the buzzword (laughs) of personalization. Oh, Oh, we're going to use our data really well. 
and we're going to personalize offers and discounts and experiences for you, the customer, and do this really great job. And it just seems like, I mean, I'd love your opinion, but it seems like uh, we don't have that many market examples of companies mm -hmm. doing it really, really well. A lot of them are on the journey, they're on the path, and they're doing their best, but there's a ways to go. So I think the trend, if you if you broaden the idea of personalization and said, I think what we're going to see this year is a pretty big shift in the way companies are collecting and managing all of their customer data. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're challenged by a few things. You, you know that the third party cookies are going away. Yeah. There's this big focus on zero party data, which means that all the data that we collect through opted in digital marketing programs, loyalty programs, becoming more and more important. So I think the importance of what we do is going to be accelerated. It's going to be accentuated and it should make the business even more exciting than it has been the last few years. But with all of that, we've also got this pressure from regulators. You know, yep. um, we can talk about it in a minute, but there's announcements from the, the attorney general in California, kind of like preparing companies that if you have a loyalty program, you better be in compliance or there are going to be big penalties. So at the same time, you've got those two forces competing a little bit, like let's do more with our data. Let's take advantage of these cookies going away, collect more zero party data than we ever have focused on that. But at the same time, oh gosh, we've got a lot of things to kind of a lot of boxes to check and make sure that we're, we're maintaining the data properly, that we're managing all the opt-ins, that we're treating the customers the way they should be treated. Absolutely. I yeah. think the, the onus on the brands, you know, and the companies is a lot more now, right? It's not just yeah. about creating the experience, but also maintaining the trust and the confidence of, of the customer, yeah. right? Like, yeah. are you going to use it, use the data for the purpose it's supposed to be for? Or are you going to, you know, basically blast me with mass emails and, right. or, or, you know, irrelevant uh, content, which mm -hmm. is not really relevant, you know, it's not going to be helpful for me at all. So it's, it's maintaining the balance, which is, it's not so easy, right? It's, this, this is why this whole personalization aspect and, you know, brands doing it really well, mm -hmm. it's taking such a long time, you know, right. first of all, a lot of companies in the beginning, you know, uh, they were not even using the data mm -hmm. effectively. And now that they're learning to use the data, we have these other roadblocks, which we need to, um, you know, cross to, to make that relationship happen. Mm -hmm. um, and the stakes are, you know, high, obviously. Yeah, so, you know, I'll be I'll be very interested to see, you know, what uh, what are some of those brands in you know, which will do this really well. Mm -hmm. I'm always, you know, on the eye out for <laughs> examples and yeah. uh, you know brands using uh, the data more effectively, especially as you said with the third party cook cookies going away, right? So how are they going to effectively use um, the zero party data? What strategies mm -hmm. would they be? Um, which also ha they have to be subtle enough, you know, um, and and as I said, build that confidence and trust with them. Right. You know, I think there's a bit of a mindset shift if you think about, you know, how we talked about uh, data is the new oil. <laughs> so yes. if if you own an oil field, you own that resource, and you just pump it out of the ground or out of the water, or wherever it comes from, and you you put it to use as fast as possible, make money with it. But I, I think the difference in mindset is from ownership to stewardship, mm -hmm. because it's really something that we don't own, but we're collecting it with permission from customers. It's a precious resource. It's definitely scarce. And like you said, you, if you don't maintain, like build in all that trust and build a strong relationship and let customers, consumers see, hey, it's, it's really worthwhile. I don't mind filling out that form to download the white paper or filling out the form just to get on some email list so I can get a discount um, because they actually are showing me that they're using it in a good way. So I think that's that's the stewardship mentality is like, I have it, but I'm really just caring for it. I don't own it, I'm caring for it. And it's at risk. So when, you know, the responsibility falls with me, the marketer to do the very best I can yes. with that asset. Absolutely. And what, what you said, you know, caught my, uh, attention like data is the new oil. I mm. think that's a great tagline. <laughs> Brands should start, you know, uh, thinking about this internally and, you know, give the importance to data uh, it deserves. Mm -hmm. 
for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what right. do you think, you know, would be the difference in approach um, for, for brands? You know, I, I, um, I feel like there needs to be a shift. As you said, the mentality needs to change. Mm -hmm. So what do you think would probably be different, you know, in terms of how they're looking at marketing or loyalty space? I'll give you a couple of sort of ups and downs, thumbs up, thumbs downs. And, and I hate to, I'm always like reticent to uh, criticize anybody too directly, but <laughs> I'd have to say the airlines fall into the category oftentimes. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we're all business travelers and you run an airplane a lot, maybe not as much as you were three, well, not years, as much now. three years ago. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I, I really feel like there's, the airlines know, you know, think about it. They were the first to get started with loyalty. And what they did is they connected their reservation system, their accounting system and revenue management. They put all that together. And so they know everything about the flyer. They know where I'm going. They have payment information. They, they can survey and things like that. But um, I'll give you an example. So I was talking about Visa a minute ago. There was a period of time when I flew predominantly um, internationally and I live in South Florida. So I had the choice of two airlines and one particular one was the one that I always took doing uh, international travel. Mm -hmm. So that came to an end at some point, it kind of slowed down and I was traveling domestically in the US. And then I was just switched over and I was just as heavy a user, but with this different airline, this competitor. Yeah. And one day, guess what? Things changed. I started traveling internationally again. Well, my hope would have been that that airline would say, oh, I have I have memory with my data. This guy was he was on our airline every other week for like five years. And yeah. So he's got the potential to be really strong. Maybe they would have offered me like at least like the first tier status or something. But no, it was like starting from scratch. You just have to have patience and build your equity in the program. And eventually you get some rewards and things. But I've always thought that for for an industry that knows so much and has a capacity to apply a little bit of um, machine intelligence and be able to know who's who, mm -hmm. they could be doing a you know a lot better. The the good the examples that I see that actually are catching my eye these days all seem to be e-commerce like e-retailers, right? And maybe it's for the same reason they they know a lot about us. They they see every place that you navigate on their website, what you do in the shopping cart, all of that. But there are a couple there that. There's one, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's great, great uh, athletic gear. It's called 10,000, but they make these fantastic um, shorts and shirts and hoodies and all these different things. But, you know, they they go out of their way to find out what you like, what mm. you do. Like, do you swim? Do you run? What do you do? And, um, and they're always, like, making suggestions. And then they also use information to explain, like, why that short would be really good for you. Like if you do this sort of thing, this is perfect. So maybe you should consider that. And I really appreciate that because I feel like, okay, they're, they're remembering and they know that I don't do CrossFit, but maybe I do run or maybe I swim or something like that. And, and they're acting on that. Yeah. You know? So I'm not just getting a mass email saying, buy these shorts, I'm getting, you know, something much more tailored. So I, I see that with, um, with a lot of e-retailers and mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had that experience too, but I feel like they're, they have equal view of data and of me, like maybe the airline, but here they're they're actually executing on it and doing a pretty good job. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Bill, you know, one of the things I was thinking about was just how the approach for loyalty has been changing, and how it can be, you know, more holistic, right? So it's not just about mm -hmm. a program and you know and done. Um, but from your experience, you know, what what do you think? You know, this holistic approach can uh, can be and what it can do for the future of loyalty? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's a big trend that we're going to see taking hold more. So I have a really good example of some work we recently did. Um, I think loyalty is moving out of the marketing area and mm -hmm. moving much more into the C-suite. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Because we, we had at Wise Marketer, we had a report, we have a report, a product called the Delphi report that we do each year. And we tackle one big question. So we wanted, this is 2019, I guess, we wanted to know why programs fail. And one of the main reasons near the top was lack of C-suite uh, support. So we realized how important it is. If you don't have that top-down support, sometimes the programs struggle. There's not a commitment maybe that you'd hope to have. 
So what we're seeing now happening, which is great, is the operation and management of loyalty is moving into a leadership position at the top tier of the company. And we worked with one very large firm uh, during the previous year, 2021, that was um, that decided to create something they called a loyalty steering committee. And so they created this cross-functional team. So people from, yes, the CEO, and but also the finance office, the operations technology, the data people, um, even some category managers and people that manage their merchandising. They brought all these people together and they made it really clear, like we're only gonna be successful in our customer loyalty efforts if we all work together and that we all have a role. And it, and it made an incredible difference because previously I think it was probably that finance, technology, operations, some of that, they looked at the marketers like, well, we could do better with loyalty. How come we're not getting better results? But now they all had a say. And so they had a forum to share all these ideas and make suggestions and improvements and things. And it's been incredible. So I, I, um, I told that particular retailer, I think that they're, they're not the first, but they're in the first wave. And we're going to see a lot more companies taking an approach like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point you made. And I'm, it, it, this should be a trend, right? We want that buy-in from the top up, you know, from the top. It's the only way to imbibe that customer centricity, you know, in, in the thread of the company. You know, it's not just mm -hmm. about, okay, mm -hmm. we're just going to do the program and we'll see how the program It's really isolated. The holistic approach you mentioned and the, you know, buying from the C-suite, I think, so critical. Um, and even even today, like I'm, you know, building these uh, loyalty programs for for different clients and different brands, right? So mm -hmm. I'm also seeing that change slowly. I'm not saying it's absolutely like you know at the top right now, but I am seeing a much bigger interest um, and you know kind of breaking the silos and they're coming together and thinking of this in in different aspects of it, right? Mm -hmm. So. How right. is this going to impact not just the um, end customer, but even our employees? You know, what is the you know what is the effect of this program on the overall organization? How is it going to impact the business goals? You know, the key KPIs. Um, right. And is is the mission of the program just retention, or is it more than that? You know, right. uh, what are we trying to come across to the end user of this? you know, the this, this strategy uh, or the program for. So, um, I mean, these discussions are very riveting and exciting. And um, it's, I think, uh, it's a great time to be part of that. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we'll see more of that as, uh, you know, as this, this year and, you know, uh, as we move forward, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned something about employees. I think yeah. that it's, it's more important than ever to try to include your employee base, your associate base into the program. So, you know, there's always been some effort or at least a gesture towards why don't we create some incentive for the associates, the frontline people in our business to be able to promote the program. And you hopefully want to equip them to understand what you're offering and how it works and be able to answer basic questions when they're standing there, you know, um, at the counter. But I, I think what I'm seeing right now is companies recognizing like this isn't just a like an and one something we should do that's a nice to have this is critical and we should definitely invest money in training um, maybe provide some more significant incentives but try to bring the employee base into it um, so that they really um, have that that passion for the loyalty program the passion for the customer inside them it's not just one more thing that the boss asked them to do and yes. and it kind of like ties in because you you've seen a lot of the research that says that especially after the last couple of years, consumers are buying a lot more from brands where they feel like they share a brand value, like a core mm -hmm. value, right? Absolutely. Um, and I, I think that there's an element of that, that it, it also works if you sense that the employees, the people that you're interacting with, because you never see the CEO as a customer, you, you see the person at the counter. Exactly. If that person knows about the program and supports it and gives you positive feedback and some, some information, you're going to feel good about it. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing, another is maybe it's a tr it's, it's an upcoming trend. Um, it's uh, it, the it, you know uh, introduction of 
or maybe you know the spread of the re re rewards and recognition programs for mm. the employees. And uh, yeah. personally, you know, we've been getting a lot of those uh, projects where you know we are really talking mm -hmm. to brands. Um, they're just focused on how can I make my employee stay and you know continue and be loyal, right, right. To, right. to my company. And I think that's a great initiative. You know, um, surprisingly, mm -hmm. I'm seeing this a lot in the financial service industry. Mm -hmm. um which you know it's it's not it's not so easy where you know there's a lot of attrition there's a lot of turnover right. um and of course intense competition so maintaining your current employee base is also so key right now it's it's very very um essential not just for business yeah. continuity but also you know to 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 be that brand uh you know the consumers are going to recognize it it's a it's a big challenge and it is I guess I'm more of an optimist than anything. So I look at it as though, yes, employee retention is so difficult. It's a big challenge. And we know about the, the yeah, great absolutely. resignation, so-called great resignation and all of this. Like there's a lot of just churn in the, in the workforce. But that tells me too, there's a lot of opportunity because I think consumers have a pretty low expectation for customer service levels and what to expect when they dial the toll-free number or they, maybe they even go in and like a chat you know, in an e-commerce site. But if you just do well, if, if you invest in some training and you have, like you say, some employee incentives that matter, yeah, you can get some improvement and, and that's going to look like a big improvement to the customer. Yeah, absolutely. A, a great example comes to mind, Southwest Airlines, right? Their rapid uh, rewards program. Mm -hmm. So the way they have integrated their employee incentive program mm -hmm. to basically take advantage of their rapid rewards program, you know, which is right. great. Like as an employee, you can get points and you can use those for travel incentives on their, their customer facing program. Mm -hmm. So not only that it ties in nicely with taking care of your employees and, um, you know, making the employee aware of your customer facing program, right? Mm -hmm. Cause they, right. they are kind of part of that. So I felt like that's such a great move to tie these, uh, the rewards together in a very in a subtle way, um, right. but I, I feel like this is this is a, this is something other brands can also look at. Oh, absolutely! It you could call it the last mile of loyalty. Some people would say it's the payment transaction, but maybe it's that person right there at the counter or the flight attendant walking down the aisle. Or, um, but yeah, there's so many opportunities for people to connect with other people at the brand and. Uh, so I think it's a great place to make an investment right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, another thing which comes to mind, and which this has been kind of a challenge and mm -hmm. in the news <laughs> for such a long time now, I feel since the pandemic hit, um, are the supply chain issues, right? It's yeah. it is kind of obviously imbibed in the in the very fiber of how we transact right now. Um, you know, with everything online, you basically just with a few clicks, you know, you just expect your product to arrive at right. your front door. <laughs> so, but what, what do brands do when things like supply, supply chain issues are going to, you know, hamper that, that seamless experience and also that, you know, the, the trust and the confidence of the consumer, right? So of course, right. as a consumer, you're aware, but you don't, probably don't care like they just need what you need so right. what is the brand's responsibility here and i feel like this is since it's it's going to be there for at least some more time uh, mm -hmm. and it's a trend uh, in in itself i feel uh, mm -hmm. they need to address so what, what do you feel like they can do to make it better it's um it's so important and you're right i think you were saying it without saying it that <laughs> all of us as consumers have so little patience we, yes. we might understand and we read all these articles about supply chain, but then we still want what we want when we go shopping or something. So Absolutely. or traveling. But no, I, I think one of the main things is communication. This is a very important time to make sure that you clearly communicate and set expect expectations with mm -hmm. customers. So, OK, think here's an example. So shopping leading up from, say, Black Friday all the way through the Christmas holidays uh, and New Year's. Um, usually you would have been just focusing on deals like discounts price breaks all this stuff and 
what I saw a lot of retailers doing this year was just reminding you constantly, if you order by a certain date, we will guarantee that you'll get your item when you want it. And I almost start to wonder, like I can't say that there's quantitative research that supports this, but I, I have a strong feeling anecdotally that uh, people probably started to value that communication and that that assurance that, okay, if I, okay, this this particular brand said, I've got until December 7th, and if I order then, I can still get my item or my my loved one, whoever it is that I'm going to send something to, is going to receive it by then. Yeah. That, that's, I bet that was more important to a lot of people than a 10% discount or a mm -hmm. coupon or something like that. And so I think it was a great example of, of a lot of retailers saying, okay, I, I see what the issue is. Um, I mean, we're having our trouble. Consumers are very concerned, our customers, and they may not shop with us if they feel like they're not going to get the item. So what do we need to do? We need to be out front communicate, let people know, like, if you do this, we guarantee to do that. And as long as they delivered on it, which the ones that I was interacting with all did, um, it was really satisfying. Like it was, it made you feel good. You know, I felt like the, there was something in there about the brand caring for me. So it was, I think that communication and getting up front of that was really important. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the brands which did get, get ahead of this and, mm -hmm. you know, treated it uh with with the respect it need, needed and the attention it needed mm -hmm. you know they they were obviously the the ones you know you were happy with and you're probably not going to switch to a competitor right because right. it's so right. easy it's not it's the stickiness is not that easy to maintain so if they feel like oh i'm not going to get the product from you i'm just going to go to somebody else so right. getting ahead of that and making sure you communicate effectively you know it could be another way to maybe give them you know extra points if they order ahead of time or some kind of um you know um a reward mm -hmm. um and it, it doesn't have to be a monetary reward it could be you know a soft reward um which which you know speaks to them at a more you know human emotional level right, right. it doesn't always have to be transactional in nature so um if they did that you know got ahead of the situation and you know try to take control of it as much as they could because at the end Still, it's not in their hands. Mm -hmm. but they're doing mm -hmm. their best. So I feel, right. I feel just the theme of uh, anticipating these issues, you know, which which are going to be a bigger, uh, big picture issue, right? Right. Um, from an from a uh, economy point of view, um, that that is going to be also key um, to to maintain a, a strong relationship with the customer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something, Bindu, it'll probably carry on into this year, don't you think? I don't think it'll be resolved by uh, March or April this year. Yeah. <laughs> These supply chain issues now, it seems like, will will probably last for a period of time. Yes. So I think it's maybe not too late, even if brands haven't jumped on that whole idea, not too late to, to start thinking about what do we do to compensate. And there there's some situations where it's really tough if you think about, back to the airlines for a second, but think about how the the in-flight cabin experience has become mm -hmm. kind of toxic. You yeah. know, all the things in the news about behavior in the cabin and various things. But, um, you know, it's it's in some circumstances, it's tough to know what can that brand, what can the airline do to, to change it or how can they make it better for um, a frequent flyer, high tier status. You know, the, those types of businesses really have a, a big challenge on their hand, but probably for retailers, for hotel companies, there, there are certain ones that you can see there, there would be a lot of solutions. And if you put your, you got the whiteboard out and um, started putting ideas on there, I'm sure you could come up with a lot of really creative solutions to help companies get ahead of that and address the whole supply chain issue. Absolutely. So, Bill, thank you so much. I think the insights you shared today, all the trends, they're going to be very interesting to watch, um, you know, as we, as we move through the year. And I'm sure there'll be more. Uh, which we might come across. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting to like uh, come across a trend which is going to be, you know, transformational. So let's let's see. <laughs> right. um, but you know, just the uh, the fact about personalization, um, you know, the challenges of personalization um, with CCPA and third party cookies going away, and what brands need to do there. 
um, the whole, you know, uh, aspect of uh, facing e economical issues like supply chain issues and what brands should be doing in terms of their communication strategy and just the holistic approach, you know, we talked about um, where the, you know, uh, C-suite is taking atten paying attention to, to, to customer loyalty and not just looking at as a just as a program um, and the impact of employees um, you know, to for, for success. I, I think these are these are things which are probably going to catch up, um, mm -hmm. you know, this year. And uh, uh, I'm, you know, looking forward to see how how things evolve. So, thank you so much uh, for sharing those. But but we are not done yet. So we okay. we have a fun challenge. Uh, yeah. We are going to do um, rapid fire. Uh, it's one, 10 under one so i'm gonna start the timer for a minute and okay. then throw questions at you and let's see you know how many you can get in a minute okay all right are you ready all right. oh it's just gonna be like an iq test <laughs> no could, could it's be gonna be fun let's just okay, say it's fun most huh. of our guests uh they enjoy it uh yeah. and you know we we don't try to embarrass anyone um <laughs> so right. let's go. i'm gonna I'm going to start the timer uh, and I'll give you a heads up. All right. I'm going to start in three, two, one. Okay. okay. Coffee in the AM or PM? Oh, AM. Okay. Instant rewards or tier status? Instant rewards. Fly or drive? I almost want to say drive. <laughs> I guess I will drive. <laughs> uh, tap card to pay or mobile pay? Mobile pay. Free delivery or same day delivery? Mm, I'll go for free. Okay. Email or yeah. SMS? <laughs> SMS. Okay. Um, use your miles more frequently or you want to save for a big vacation? I've been using it more frequently lately. Yeah. Okay. Um, messenger or social media? Mm. Um, messenger. Okay. Yeah. Um, free loyalty program or paid loyalty program? Ooh, there's a case for the paid, but I'd say free. I still like free. <laughs> and number of, oh, we are out of time. Oh, no. <laughs> well, well, it's on me. Maybe some of the you know options were too long for me to say. <laughs> but you did great. My last one was uh, num number of loyalty program apps on your phone. Ooh, at least 20. 20. Yeah. Okay, okay. I mean, that's expected, you know. Just yeah. like, just that's how I like. join everything. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, that was fun. I, I hope you had fun with that. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay, great. Great. That's great. Well, I want to thank you again for your time and sharing your, you know, insights on loyalty trends. So cheers to you again. Cheers to you. Thanks to Comark. Thanks for your wonderful hosting job. I think thank you, you have, so a, much. Uh, thank you you have another career opportunity if you choose to, to, <laughs> to go on television or radio or be the next podcaster so well thank you for that and you know uh, i'm sure we will do a repeat uh you know this is this is something which is going to uh be relevant i say all the time you know uh same time next year let's just book that right all right i'm game <laughs> that sounds good yeah perfect and thank you everyone for tuning in and taking your coffee break with us stay safe we'll see you next time thank you thanks <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,